at least 35 kids back here somewhere, whether in nursery, in children's ministry, or in the three to five class. And so uh, I would be praying for the leaders who are in there right now because they've got all that you want and more. I mean, I think there were 10 in the nursery, there were 14 in the children's ministry, and there were another 10 in the three to five-year-old class. And so, man, you need to be praying. That's not even counting the little ones that are still in this room. Um, man, what an awesome testimony to what the Lord is doing generation to generation. Amen? You want to see a church that's growing, it's good to have a church with children in it. <laughs> you know, that's the reality. Matthew chapter number five, let me say this. Uh, you um, are here for a reason. Some of you may have come um, just sort of uh, as your first priority, that this, hey, this is what I'm going to do, and this is how I'm going to do it. Uh, some of you, maybe this, you're at a point where this is your last resort, and you thought, this is, uh, I just need something from the Lord today, so I'm hoping I'm going to show up, so He's going to give it to you, and then maybe some of you are just here because you're in between both of those. Um, you know, it, it just has become maybe routine for you. I just want to affirm in you that the Lord has already and wants to continue to minister to you today. That this is something that He wants to do every time we gather, and especially when we gather together, He, want, he has something for you. And I can attest to that from first service, and I can certainly attest to that now. I know the Lord wants to move if you'll let him move. Amen? Amen? And by the way, it's not about whether he wants to move. It's about whether you want to receive. That's, right. That's the reality. He's got something he wants to offer you. Just do you want to receive it? And I can assure you it's a good gift, even though it may not look, what you, look like what you expected it to look like. And how often does he do that? Right? How often does he give you something and you were saying, this is not what I was expecting to get today, and yet it was a blessing nonetheless. Amen? That's how he moves. That's what he does. And you're here for that reason. And we're so thankful that you are. I'm going to ask you to just lift me up um, this morning as I lift you guys up. Uh, maybe some of you uh, feel free to you lift your hands up. And I'm going to lift my hand towards you. And I'm just going to pray over you. Father, I love you. <clears throat> I can't say that enough. Father, I could echo that from now into eternity, and it would not touch the depth at which you love me and that I long to love you. And so, Father, we just set ourselves before you just in, in anticipation uh, with expectancy, knowing that you want to move however you want to move and that you want to do some things that you want to do. And we hold, we hold fast to your word. We know this is a time where your word is exposed and we want to hold fast to it, Father. We want to receive your word, Father, and we want it to radically uh, and immediately begin to work in our lives in such a way that um, we move in the direction that you want us to move. And Father, I pray that every enemy, every principality, every power, every presence of darkness, that it has no say in this time, Father, that you would bind them up and cast them out in Jesus' name. And then on top of that, Father, that you would be high and lifted up and exalted and that your light would so shine before men that it would radically blow us back, Father, that everything that you want to say and do would move from our head to our heart, settle there, and be ready for us to go forward. And we're just going to trust you to do that. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen and amen. I long for the Lord. Um, I, I long for Jesus to be my standard. There are seasons in my life where I'm not sure what to do. And I long to look to Him to give me clarity and guidance. And I was looking up the word standard because I really thought the Lord was going to go somewhere different with, my, with the message here in Matthew chapter number 5 today. You know, we've been talking the last month where Jesus went up on the mount and He begins to give the longest sermon that we have recorded in Scripture. It's something about four or five chapters long that he preaches a long sermon to the people who've shown up on that hillside over a period of two or three days. And so now we're, we want to know about the kingdom. This is what Jesus is saying. The kingdom of heaven is like, and we want the kingdom of heaven to come down. I don't want the same old, same old. You've been in places and seasons in your life where just the same um, rote and, and meticulous things, the same sort of bland things happen over and over and over again. I don't ever want that. Man, I want just heaven to come down and whatever the Lord wants, is doing there, that's what I want him doing here. But to do that, 
um, he's got to be high and lifted up. He's got to be the standard, right? And a standard, I looked it up, the fourth definition on the, in the dictionary that I looked it up in, a standard's literally just like a flag that's flown on a pole during a time of battle. And so what they would tend to do is they would fly that flag so you would know, okay, there's where my comrades, there's where my, my warriors are. I need to get to them. That's where I want to be. And see, Jesus needs to be that standard. I want to see him lie and lift it up. And so when I'm in the middle of a mess, and man, Lauren and I were talking about this last night. Sometimes, man, we, say, we can't see the forest for the trees. It just feels like we're just in the daily routine of life, and there's so much craziness going on in our daily routine that it's hard for us to really see what Jesus really wants us to do. So it's good for us to sort of get up above the action, see where the standard is, and go to that. Because I believe Jesus, as the standard in your life, will radically change the situation that you're in. And some of you can testify to some radical and amazing transformations in your life because you decided to look at Jesus as the standard and not everything that the world or culture is trying to do in your life. Let's look at Jesus as the standard. By the way, when you do that, it might look a little different than what you're used to. In fact, just about every time, it's going to look different than what you're used to it looking like because Jesus is radical in every good sense of the word. Look at the, the, the word of God, Matthew chapter number 5. We're going to pick it up in verse uh, number 21. You've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you, to everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to hell of fire, to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come offer your gift. Come to terms quickly with your accuser while you're going with him to court, lest your accuser hand you over to the judge, and the judge to the guard. And, and you be put in prison. Truly I say to you, you will never get out until you have paid the last penny. Let me say, Jesus has got a different standard. In fact, I thought this sermon was going to be, um, he said what? I thought it was going to be something along those lines. Because what we tend to do is we tend to set our, our minds and our hearts sometimes on the things of the world. And we tend to buy into what they say, right? And you guys know that if you ever watch... Uh, some of you will go home this afternoon and watch a football game, and there will be commercial after commercial after commercial telling you what you need, right? And boy, they will try and lure you in with what they want to say. And the reality is, the Bible in Galatians chapter 1 says, hey, you can either be a pleaser of men, or you can be a servant of God. Those are your two options. You can't play in between. And so I want Jesus to be that standard. But when he's that standard, that means some things that I used to hear or used to think were important maybe aren't so important anymore. And the things that I used to sort of lessen and not think were as important, maybe the Lord in his kingdom think are a little more important. And the reality is if Jesus is the standard, there's three things here that we need to pay attention to. The first is, and, and hopefully this will settle somewhere in your spirit, but the reality is when Jesus is the standard, um, he wants to deal with the root in your lives, the roots in your lives and not the symptoms. Because the Bible says, hey, you've heard it said of old that you shall not murder. But basically, I'm telling you, murder is just a symptom of the real issue. The real issue is anger. And the reality is, um, Edelweiss and I were walking in the park um, two days ago on Sunday at a park up in the mountains. And they have this, man, this beautiful um, one mile uh, eight loop that you can sort of uh, walk, around, uh, walk along or run along or ride your bikes along. But as we were walking, Edelweiss had noticed that they had spray painted some areas along sort of that concrete uh, walkway. And she said, what is that? And what it was was there were trees over beside the walkway, and the roots had come up and began to mash the, the walkway up. And they had spray painted it so that runners or people who are walking or people who are riding their bike can see th this is going to be bumpy if you go across this, try to avoid it. And so I explained to her, hey, these roots have come up. And the crazy thing was, the one that we passed by, it was just a stump there, but the roots were still there. See, if you want, if you want to get rid of a tree, you can't just chop it down. you got to get it up by the roots. And the Lord is saying, I'm not about dealing with the symptoms. I'm a surgeon. I'm about dealing with the roots. If you want to figure out how to get into some, a season of your life where you're in right relationship with the Lord, you're going to have to let him deal with some roots and not the symptoms. And the reality is there are things, see, symptoms just show up after the fact. 
Really what's going on is there's an issue somewhere in your heart that he wants to deal with, that everything's being manifest out of that. See, that's why he said murder's not really the issue. I'm, I'm calling you to a higher standard. The standard is not, man, you shouldn't murder. That's just a reflection or reaction to what's really going on. The real issue is you've got anger in your heart. Let me deal with that. And he's going to do that over and over and over again in the remainder of chapter 5 and all of chapter 6. He's going to say all these issues that, that the Pharisees have made a big deal. Man, they're all superficial. Really, what's going on in your heart? Because the Lord is after your heart. He's after your heart. All this stuff's going to pass away. He's after your heart. And usually our heart is where the problems that we tend to have. Because the Bible says out of the heart, the mouth speaks. Usually the problems that we have flow out of the heart. And that's the root issues that the Lord's trying to get to and deal with. And the main issue is once you deal with those roots, you can move into right relationship with Him and with each other. And that's the second thing. You'll notice, look at Matthew chapter number 5, and then we're going to flip back to Genesis. But look at Matthew chapter number 5, right here in the middle. He says, But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says, You fool, will be liable to the hell of fire. So if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift before the altar and go. See, the Lord desires relationship with you before your righteous acts. In fact, He desires relationship with you and then your righteous acts should flow. And I can show it to you in Scripture. Flip with me to Genesis chapter number 2. Man, just a powerful passage in the Word of God. Genesis chapter number 2. And we're going to pick it up after chapter number 2 in verse number 7. Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 7. See, once the Lord begins to deal with roots, He wants you to make right some relationships. And He's all about relationships. Look at Genesis chapter number 2, verse number 7. Then the Lord God formed the man uh, of dust from the ground, and He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature, and the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there He put the man whom He had formed... And out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of, of the knowledge of good and evil. But look at verse number 7 especially. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of, the breath of life. See, you were created for a relationship before you were created to act. And I want you to think about this for a second. I, was, I said first service, I can count on one hand, but that's not true. Um, I, I, my, my kids alone make up one hand, right? But I can, I can count on probably five, maybe, maybe two hands, maybe three hands. I can count on that many hands. How many people? Here, come here, Lauren. That's good. He said she doesn't know what's going on right here. That's good. It's always good when she doesn't know. It's probably better. For the Lord to get down and form dust out of the ground. And then the Bible says he breathed life into his nostrils. Do you know how close you've got to be to be in somebody's nostrils? I mean, there's only a few people in your life that you want to be that close to. And see, she's not uncomfortable because I'm that close to her. She's uncomfortable because you guys are watching. That's, that's what she's uncomfortable about. <laughs> to be that close, that's intimacy. God created you in intimacy with himself. Before he did anything else, he created you to be in intimacy with himself, in relationship with himself. And there's only, a, like I said, there's only a few people. Some of you can't count, but just on one hand. It's your kids and maybe your parents. And outside of that, you're not going to get close like that to anybody because you've been created to be in relationship and intimacy. The Father wants you to be that way with him. And the Pharisees had mucked it up. They had said, hey, here's the problem. Sin's the issue. God has made sin the issue. We need to get back right with God. And so they've added on to the law and saying, hey, look, if you're going to do it, this is how you need to do it. And the Lord never, God never orchestrated it to be that way. That's why Jesus said, I'm coming on the scene and I'm going to say, 
My Father created you to be in relationship with Himself. He also created you to be in relationship with each other. So if you're going to bring an offering and say you've wronged somebody, then before you even lay that gift down, you need to go to that person and be in relationship with them and make it right. <coughs> if the Lord in heaven, who loves you and knows you, created you to be in relationship with Him, His desire for you is to be in relationship with one another. Before anything else. And then it's not until later. I want you to see. Look at verse number 15. Then the Lord or the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to keep it. Before the righteous act. Before Adam was given a task to do. To tend to the garden that God had created. He created him a relationship. And do you know you're the only, our creation, you as creation are the only ones who got created that way? He used the same breath of life, but he spoke it out. The only one he blew into was you and me. And so they had mucked it up. And so Jesus steps onto the scene and says, here's the standard. You've heard it said, don't murder. And if you're going to deal with that, you're going to go to the altar and you're going to lay your offering down and then move on. And Jesus said, you guys have mucked it up. You shouldn't go lay your gift down until you've been reconciled in right relationship with your brother. See, that's the new ministry. That's the new standard that Jesus has set. Is to say, I want you to be in relationship with me and relationship with each other before you even do your righteous act. And what we tend to do is we tend to flip the script. Now the problem is the righteous act, it doesn't have anything but a little bit of responsibility. There's no relationship in a righteous act. You're just saying, hey, I'm going to do this to get it out of the way. And how many, listen, Lauren and I have been in places where there's been a lot of morally good people and a lot of righteous acts, but no relationship. And we hated it. Now, some of it is because if you came and spent 10 minutes with us, you better be all about some relationship because our kids are going to be all up in your mess (laughs) and all up in your business. And so our life revolves around relationship. But it's what we were created for. You know, a lot of times we can't deal, and you can't deal with relationship until you've dealt with some roots. What tends to happen, man, is the enemy tends to weigh you down with junk. And you thought, man, if I get up in front of people and they see my junk, it's not going to be good. And the reality is either Jesus died and already paid for that junk or he didn't. (laughs) See, we've not been given a ministry of dealing with sin. We've been given a ministry of the third thing, which is reconciliation. See, as believers, it's not our job to get out and call out sin. It's our job to reconcile right relationship when we've wronged them. Look what the Word of God says in Matthew chapter number 5. I want you to see this. What do we reconcile? To reconcile simply means to bring back or put back what was lost or what was taken away. When you reconcile something, you go and take it and put it back where it belonged. And so the Word of God says in Matthew chapter number 5, first, be re- this is verse number 24, leave your gift before the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother and then come offer your gift. See, the Lord said, man, I want to deal with the root issues. The root issue is not murder, it's anger. And when you'll deal with the root issue, then I want you to be in right relationship with one another. And the only way to be in right relationship with one another is to be reconciled. To go and stand. And let me tell you, that takes intimacy. Um, I, I can't. I want, to, I want to emphasize this as believers of the Most High. We're not the sin police. We're not on it to go and point other people's sin out because either Jesus died for those sins and the sacrifice was made or He didn't. And if you truly believe that He did, then it's not about pointing out each other's sin. It's about going before them and and saying before them, man, I've wronged you. Will you forgive me? And we be reconciled. Now, the reason I say that is there's biblical examples of this. 
her, right? Um, I think about the woman who's caught in adultery. And the way the Lord handles that situation is so different because they said, hey, I know what the law says. But it, man, let him who's without sin, let them cast the first stone. See, the Lord operated in a ministry of reconciliation. You look at what Peter did, man. Nobody loved the Lord more than Peter. We know that biblically. Man, 24 hours before he's going to be crucified, he looks at the person that he loves. Peter looks at Jesus and says, man, I would never deny you. I'll go to the cross with you. In fact, when they show up to take Jesus, he pulls his sword out and chops a, 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 a soldier's ear off in hoping to kill that man and defend his Savior, defend his friend. But it's not 24 hours later that we see Peter weeping and mourning, basically vomiting his guts up because he had done exactly what the Lord said he would do. He had denied him three times. By the time you get to the end of the book, Peter's gone back to fishing. The Lord has died, been buried, and resurrected. And Peter said, this is not what I expected. I wasted three years of my life. I'm just going to go back to what I know. And when Jesus shows up on the scene, Here's what the Lord does. He doesn't shame him. He doesn't say, I told you, Peter. I told you you would deny me, and you did exactly what I told you you'd do. He doesn't show up and say, Peter, I was planning on building my church on you, but you failed, and now I can't use you. No, he goes to him and says, Peter, do you love me? And that word there for love is phileo. Do you love me like a friend? Do you love me like a brother? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And, and the Lord says, man, just, just tend to my sheep. Keep my sheep. And then a second time he says, do you phileo? Do you love me like a brother, like a friend? And Peter says, man, yes, I love you like a brother or a friend. And then the third time he says, do you love me? But this time he switches it up and he says, do you agape me? Which is, means, do you love me like God loves all mankind? And he said, yes. And he said, feed my sheep. See, Jesus didn't come in shame. He didn't come and point things out. He came and dealt in a ministry of reconciliation, saying, I want to reconcile you back into right relationship with my father, even though you messed up. Now, the reason I say that is we see it scripturally. I, b I believe that the reason that the church has not been more fruitful than it has is because, man, most churches, most gatherings are more about calling out sin and saying, this is what sin looks like and shame on you forever doing it, rather than the ministry of our Savior, which is reconciliation. The reason I say that is because Lauren and I, uh, we've been here a year and a couple months now, um, but the weekend before I was supposed to come here um, that Friday, Lauren had gone and had a conversation with some people that she loved and trusted, and she came back and essentially said, hey, I think we just need to have a conversation. And I said, okay. And, and she just said, hey, do you feel like maybe there's some roots in your life of some things that's limiting just us being able to move forward well? And, of course, I, I said, no, nah, I'm good. You know, I, I, I'm good. There's nothing going on in my life. And she just said, I need you to ask Holy Spirit. And I thought, well, I don't like this. Because um, nobody knows me like Holy Spirit, right? So nobody knows. And so, man, I paused and, and I said, Holy Spirit, is there anything in my life that just is limiting? Anything that's rooted there that's limiting us from moving forward? And immediately he showed me two things. And I, my heart dropped um, because I knew I had sinned against her in a couple ways. And... Um, and this scripture just came barreling towards me, you know, don't, don't lay an offering down, man. You need to be reconciled with the one that you love. And I'm telling you, to handle something like that in intimacy, boy, it's no joke. Because you're like a nerve, you're exposed. And she said, oh, the Lord gave you something. And I said, uh -huh. And boy, there was no turning back at that point. Like, I could fake it till I make it, but I'd have never made it. And so... I'm literally two days from preaching before you guys as a body. And this, this sin issue has come up that the Lord has paid for. 
but I knew had affected her. Right? And so the enemy's saying, oh, man, the Lord's already paid for it. Let me tell you, your sin has already been dealt with on Calvary, what we call vertically. But the issues that flow from it horizontally, you still got to deal with. That's why the Word of God says, be reconciled to your brother. Go and st-. That's why in James it says, confess your faults one to another. You know, the reality is I knew that we had to walk through that. And it was no joke. Like it got real in a heartbeat. And um, the, the messiness of it was there. Um, when you've sinned against somebody and then you're exposed before them, it can be messy when you're trying. Let me testify to this, though. I've never gone to somebody and said, I wronged you, will you forgive me? And not heard the, heard the words, I forgive you. Never. I can't think of one instance where I've wronged somebody and gone to them and said, man, I wronged you, will you forgive me? Now, there's been times where that person has looked at me and said, I need time to process this for a minute because it came out of nowhere. And so it's taken a little bit of time. But the Bible's pretty clear about forgiveness. Forgive. And you shall be forgiven. So I had set my offering down and I had gone to try and be reconciled with Lauren. And she said, I need time to process this. And she took 24 hours and then we came back together after much weeping and much discerning and and much praying. And she just simply said, I forgive you. Now there's two two reasons why that's amazing. The first one is, the enemy deals in unforgiveness. And so he's the one who comes and points out all the problems that you, she can't, she said, couldn't get out that door, it wouldn't let me out. (laughs) But um, anytime you're dealing with unforgiveness, the enemy comes. He can still accuse. You know, because you've not righted that relationship, so the enemy can still accuse. And does he not get in your heads? Does he not get in your heads about some things and start saying, oh yeah, they did this and they did that. When you've walked in reconciliation, the enemy has no grounds to stand on. And the second that he comes, you just simply say, man, that's been forgiven every single time. I really believe the reason the church has not exploded more, not just our gathering, but I'm just talking about his bride, has not exploded more. It's because we got caught up as a church and being a little bit pharisaical, a little bit like the scribes and saying, I see your sin, you better go do things right. Instead of saying, man, here's my sin, will you forgive me and let's be in right relationship with one another. It's not your job to point out sin, by the way. You know what your job is to do if you feel like you've been sinned against? Pray. That's your job. The Bible says, man, you've got to remove the beam out of your eye before you can take the speck out of somebody else's. Have you ever seen somebody with a speck in their eye and you can just reach in there and just sort of touch it and it pulls onto your fingertip and pulls away? Have you ever tried to pull a beam out of your own? You know why he uses that metaphor? Because it's impossible. You cannot do it. You can't reach in. Number one, a beam can't fit in there. But he's saying, hey, look, that's not something you can do. That's not what my ministry is about. My ministry is about reconciling. It's about saying, man, will you forgive me? And then people offering forgiveness. Because the reason he wants to reconcile is because he wants us to walk in community. You know what I think of when I think of community? People who commune in unity. And you can't do that when you've wronged your brother or your sister. And they've not had an opportunity to forgive. There have been a lot of times, too, that I've walked in and said, would you forgive me? And they would say, I didn't realize you did that. (laughs) I've walked in situations where I said, man, I cannot believe I said this about you or I did this. Will you forgive me? And they simply say, I didn't even know that happened. Dude, move on. And I'm like, oh, my gosh, the enemy has been hounding me for a week or a month about this. And it was no big deal to them at all. I'm here to tell you, God desires to walk in just alongside you. And he desires to reconcile relationships through the power of forgiveness. I just long for that. I'm going to ask the praise team to come. Gwen's going to come and play quietly, but I'm going to ask the praise team to come on up. And we're going to ask Holy Spirit just three simple questions.
um, two years ago, I was sitting with a group of men, and um, a man who was in his 50s got up and testified um, about a root that had been planted in his life when he was young, and it was affecting how he loved his sons. the man said, I remember my father used to abuse me when I was little. Physically put my hands on me and beat me up. And he said, when I was in my teenage years or a little bit older, I just said, I will never let another man put his hands on me like that again. Never. And this man's a big man. And he's a, 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 a just a big man. And that day, he had wanted to minister to his son. He wanted to love on his son. But the enemy had crept in and said, hey, you, you made a vow that you'd never put your hand, let, your, let a man put their hands on you again. So you've never loved your sons that way. And he got before another group of men, us men, and just said, man, that was a root that was planted to me a long time ago, and I don't like it. Because I've not been able to love my sons the way that I wanted to because of that root. And man, when that his son came back, he just grabbed him with both arms and hugged him. And I, I'm sure his son was totally confused. But man, it was a root that had to, and he used that phrase. He said, that root had been there 50 years. And I had not loved my sons the way that I could have because of that root. So there may be some and, and you know what it affected? It affected relationships, right? And because it affected relationships, man, he needed to reconcile those relationships and back to what it should have been in the beginning. He needed to go back and say, I love you, I see you, let me hold you. And so there may be some things that Holy Spirit wants to deal with in terms of roots this morning for you. I believe you can ask Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, are there any roots in my life that you want to deal with today. And then the second question we're going to ask is, are, are there any relationships that need to be reconciled? Is there anybody that I've wronged that I need to go and ask forgiveness of so that we can move together in unity? And the Lord may reveal somebody, Holy Spirit may reveal somebody immediately, and you'll know, I've got to make a phone call this afternoon. I had a lady come up to me after first service and say that something happened 30 or 40 years ago and I've got to find out if this man's still alive because I, I made a casual statement and I said, the, she said, the only thing I can know is that Holy Spirit revealed that to me and I need to try and find that man, see if he's alive and ask his forgiveness for making that statement. Now, there's a high probability that man doesn't even remember that statement. He may not even remember her. The Holy Spirit said, this is what I need you to do. I don't need you to offer an offering. I need you to go to that man and be reconciled, and then you can come offer an offering. In fact, I would venture to say that some of you are desiring God to move in your life in some ways, and you feel like you're hitting a brick wall. And you're thinking, why can I not move forward in this? I love you, Lord. And he's saying, first be reconciled to your brother. Then lay your offering down, and the blessings can first you need to be reconciled.